That's cool that it's, you know, working with both, right? Edge and cloud um, and, and yeah. seeing those kind of intersect as well um, yeah. instead of just one or the other. But before we kind of get into more of the applications and examples, just from the broader perspective, since this is a material science podcast in nature, can you talk about the materials that go into these systems yeah. that enable to, all of these applications? <laughs> yes, because I know I've been talking pretty high level, but, you know, I am a physicist. I do my PhD in physics. I love materials. <laughs> uh, yes. So in my group, we particularly work on two types of materials for all these applications I've been talking about. So um, we work on magnetic materials, but scale down to be very, very small. So nanoscale magnetic materials. And we also work on two dimensional materials, 2D materials. These are naturally atomically thin materials. Those are the main classes that we are exploring to apply to neuromorphic computing and other uh, future of computing applications. I'm happy to talk about either one of those both, whatever you want. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm your host, Puneet. I have David with me today. How's it going, David? Pretty good, pretty good. We just finished the recording. And so I think that there's so much that we want to just jump right in. So maybe we can just tell us about our favorite parts. Uh, I guess I could start. We talked to Dr. Jean Ann Incorvia today, and she's a professor at UT Austin, uh, working on neuromorphic chips, which are chips which are trying to emulate uh, biological systems like our brain. And so I think that my favorite part of the episode was just her detail that she went into with all these different material types and exactly how they work and what their effect is on the computing like infrastructure itself. And so there was one which was spintronics, which is using the magnetic spin of orbitals of your electron orbitals to be able to do uh, informational work. And so she goes in great detail about how it works, the pros and cons of it. And it's just something that we learn about in like our first day of chemistry, but I never really thought of any way to practically use it other right. than knowing like the position of your electron. So I thought it was super interesting. What was your favorite part? Yeah, my I was gonna say the same thing, but because you stole it, I'll I'll choose a different <laughs> different idea. But I thought what was super fascinating about her work was the interdisciplinary nature and all the cross functional partners that she works with. You know, she works with Samsung, she works with Sandia National Lab. Even within her lab group, there's various areas to focus on in like the vertical chain. And then she also works with neuroscientists. She works with like what was it? Probability based, I think like statisticians, et cetera. Yeah. So um, it was, it was just really, really cool to see like, oh, you know, to really make an impact in this very new growing field, it's vital to be able to interact and learn from other partners. You know, she was saying that she learns from neuroscientists every day, but also neuroscientists learn from them. So it's really like mutually beneficial. So yeah, and then she goes into advice as well for students who are interested in this in this space um, and what the field could look like in the future. So there's really a lot that we cover here, but I just wanted to say, you know, this is our 100th episode, I believe. Um, unless something changes. And so, you know, we finally hit triple digits and I think that's a super exciting milestone. So just wanted to thank you all for joining us for the ride. Um, and if you could leave a, a rating and review, uh, that would really help us out. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Hello, everyone. For today's episode, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jean Ann Incorvia. Dr. Incorvia is a current assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where she researches nanotechnology for computing applications. Prior to her professorship at UT Austin, she earned her bachelor's in physics from UC Berkeley and her PhD in condensed matter physics in 2015, utilizing a cross-registration registration program with Harvard and MIT. Dr. Incorvia did her postdoc at Stanford, researching energy-efficient computing, which led to her current position at UT Austin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So as David mentioned, you're an expert on and do research in nanotechnology for computing applications, but more specifically, you work with neuromorphic computing, which is based on the architecture of the brain. So can you briefly break down how that works and what it offers over traditional computing? Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So traditional computing is based on a particular building block called the transistor, which is how we encode zeros and ones. 
So a transistor is a channel and either conducts electrons, that's a one, or it doesn't conduct electrons and that's a zero. And that's how we build our computers today. We arrange those in different um, circuits and then we build up systems. And so neuromorphic computing is rethinking the structure of computers from the bottom up. So instead of the basic building block of transistors, we have different building blocks, which are neurons and synapses. So these are functioning to mimic the neurons and synapses in the mammalian brain. And so just like how transistors are really good at building computers that do things like high performance computing, factoring really large numbers, perhaps these different building blocks of neurons and synapses can build computers that can do things our brains are good at, like uh, interacting with the world or making an, an informed decision with many different inputs. So that, that's what neuromorphic computing is about from the hardware perspective. Awesome. So you say that right now we use transistors, but we want to move to this new form of how computers are making decisions. From a material science point of view, what changes? So I guess the question is, are there, will there be new types of transistors and will be, there will be new types of materials needed to allow this change to occur? Yes, that's why this is such an exciting um, shift that really is great for material science as well, because you can think of all the wonderful technology we've developed over the past decades has been this tight co-design between the materials and the devices, which is silicon and transistors, and the architecture, how we put those together to build computers, which is called the von Neumann architecture. And so that's led us to so many wonderful technologies. That's just amazing to think what we what we have now and we didn't have 10, 20 years ago. And now we can think of that as this well-refined tunnel that's led us to today. And we're at this really great moment in computing where we're branching out and we're seeing what's next after this tunnel. Neuromorphic computing is one major direction that we are looking to go for the future of computing. And as we think of new ways to put our building blocks together, it means also there's room for new materials and new devices. It's no longer that the transistor might, the transistor might no longer be the ideal device and silicon might no longer be the ideal material for these new types of architectures and systems. And so uh, it's a really great opportunity for a new type co-design with new materials, new devices, new circuits and new systems, bringing them together for these new applications. That's awesome. Um, so I was just wondering, so this seems very like cross disciplinary in nature, you know, talking about the architecture of the brain, as well as these computing applications, nanotechnology, et cetera. So I was just curious then how, like from the, the brain side of things, how much do we know? Like, I've just heard generally that, you know, we don't really know so much about our brain. That's still a very, neuroscience is still a very new field. So then how does that potentially make an impact in your work and as well as like the potential for growth in uh, this specific space? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's really true that the field of neuroscience is also an active research field, right? So we don't know everything about what is useful in the brain. And that comes in in two main ways I can think of. First of all, it's like, what features do we extract from the brain and put into our artificial neurons and synapses to get them to do certain tasks? And that's an open question. So you can start with some basic features and that's really what our field is doing so far. So we're taking neurons, we have certain models of how neurons behave one example model is a leaky integrate and fire model. So the neuron has impulses, which then integrate over time until it reaches some firing point and then it fires. And then if it's not getting those impulses, then it can relax back to its original state. So that's the leaking integrate and fire model. So we can take that model and then we can try to use materials and build devices that can do that kind of function. And for synapses, similarly, at the most basic level, we know that they encode the connectivity between neurons. So we can extract that as a weight. So if they're more strongly connected, they have a higher weight, less strongly connected, have a lower weight. And so again, we take that and we put that into artificial synapses and we want devices that have multiple resistance levels that we can control. And those can be our connectivity weight. And we want them to then be able to be um, strengthened and weakened as well by applying 
concurrent to those synapses. So those are the models that we can extract right now, but it's a really open question of what are these higher order functions that we know exist in the brain and which one of those, which of those do we need to bring into our computers and what impact can it have if we did? And that's a super open question. And so uh, in our research group, we collaborate with um, neuroscientists and that's a lot of fun um, because they are only recently discovering new important effects and then we can um, bring those features into our materials and devices. I'm happy to give examples if you want at some point. One other thing though, that's exciting about this space in terms of neuroscience is that we can learn from the neuroscientists but they can also learn from us. They really enjoy working with us because they're hoping that as we develop neuromorphic computing with new materials and new hardware, which is more brain mimetic, that we can learn about how the brain operates. For example, this is something they've told me, they say that it's easy to measure neuronal activity, but it's harder to measure what's actually happening with the synapses. So if in our artificial neuromorphic computers, we can get a closer look at what the synapses are doing, that can inform it can be like a platform for studying the models they're developing of the brain. I guess before we dive into some of the examples, because we'd love to hear more about the actual use cases. One question I had is that I think we're all familiar with how uh, computers like interact and we work with them. We might not understand like exactly how the transistors work to make the circuit board, et cetera. But my question is for neuromorphic chips, is that going to change how we use computers? Or what exactly would the change be that we see while using technology? Yeah, so there's multiple directions that we could see application of neuromorphic computing. One more near-term one is smart edge AI, we say. That's a lot of words right there. But edge means not in the cloud. (laughs) There's edge and there's cloud. So edge means on our devices or in a satellite in space or in a self-driving car, right? So computing done on the edge. And they are just like our brains. Our brains are a lot more energy efficient at computing than our computers are. So when you're computing on the edge, energy efficiency is key, right? You need to make sure that your battery doesn't run out. You need to make sure that that you can sustain that computing on the edge. And so we hope that neuromorphic computing can provide that energy efficiency, which will enable a lot more smart computing on the edge. And part of that is we want to be able to compute directly on the edge and then send some tailored subset of data back to the cloud for future computer future or further computing. And the cloud then is the computing that goes on in um, computing centers. And then the information can be sent back and forth to the edge. So that's how it works. So that's one obvious application of neuromorphic computing is on the edge, kind of where our brains are operating on the edge, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, another, but then there's other Even in in the more high performance computing, there are applications there as well. I'm in one co-design research team right now working on how to build new materials and devices for stochastic computing, which is a flavor of related to neuromorphic computing because we know our brain um, uses randomness and stochasticity in its processing. And so bringing that into our computers could be beneficial also for high performance computing. So there we're looking at how that could be beneficial for solving naturally stochastic problems. Like for example, analyzing particle physics data or climate change data. There's there's applications in the edge and the cloud and maybe other new applications beyond those two categories. That's cool that it's, you know, working with both right edge and cloud um, and and seeing those kind of intersect as well um, instead of just one or the other. But before we kind of get into more of the applications and examples, just from the broader perspective, since this is a material science podcast in nature, can you talk about the materials that go into these systems that enable all of these applications? (laughs) Yes, because I know I've been talking pretty high level, but, you know, I am a physicist. I do my PhD in physics. I love materials. (laughs) Uh, Yes. So in my group, we particularly work on two types of materials for all these applications I've been talking about. So um, we work on magnetic materials, but scale down to be very, very small. So nanoscale magnetic materials. And we also work on two-dimensional materials, 2D materials. These are naturally atomically thin materials. Those are the main classes that we are exploring to apply to neuromorphic computing and other uh, future of computing applications. I'm happy to talk about either one of those both, whatever you want. Yeah. I guess I was, I was, 
I would love to dive into like the 2D materials first, you know, like, because sure. what I've heard are, you know, graphene, I feel like is kind of one of those examples or, you know, the main things that come to mind from the 2D materials, but would just love to hear more about like those specific, that specific use within the neuromorphic computing field. Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. 2D materials are, like I said, naturally atomically thin. So one out of thick. And as you said, graphene is the first one discovered and it's um, the most well-known and it's a lovely material. It's a, a one atom thick layer of carbon atom. And you can layer different layer number on top of each other. They're really interesting because since they're naturally smooth on the surface, it's very attractive for all sorts of computing applications that are scaled down. Because when we make things really small, we also need to make them very thin. And that's to be able to control what's going on in them really well. And so that's why tuning materials are being actively pursued for all sorts of future computing, and including traditional von Neumann computing, the kind of computing that our computers operate on today. Uh, for neuromorphic computing, we can use that scaleness, and then we can also use other effects that arise due to this electron confinement in these thin layers. So in our group, one of the papers we published recently was on making graphene into an artificial synapse. So like I was talking about one of the two building blocks of our neuromorphic computers. And so really, it's just utilizing the fact that since it's such a smooth, flat surface, if you put almost anything on top of it, it's very responsive to something put on top. <laughs> and so we make them in a, a transistor and then you can put, right now we're putting a nafion layer on top, which is like a polymer layer. And then if we apply a voltage to the polymer layer, we can control the connectivity across the channel. We can then with our voltage pulses, get different conductances, different resistance levels across our bilayer graphene transistor. So we've shown that it can be a really nice, like I said, there's these basic model of a, of a synapse is that it should be what's called linear and symmetric, and it can satisfy a nice linearity and symmetry. And then we've also shown that it can have some higher order behavior to its potentiation and depression. These are how you strengthen those weights or um, weaken those weights. And that also can be useful for applications in normal fit computing. That's awesome. And the other material system that you primarily use is what again? So this particular paper was on graphene, um, mm -hmm. but our group does work not just on graphene. We're interested in the whole library of 2, 2D materials. So there are um, dozens of 2D materials now that are being actively pursued. And so we're very interested in applying them to computing. Did you mention, I think this was potentially in, in another call, but Spintronics, is that something that is relevant and could you go into that? Cause I, I haven't yes. really heard that term. Yes. So the other material class I work in is magnetic materials and that's the field of spintronics. Electronics is we are encoding information with electrons. There's also photonics, which we're encoding information with photons and light. So spintronics means that we are encoding information in spin. So electron spin and the magnetization of a material. I think probably most listeners are familiar with electron spin, yep. but maybe if you're not. <laughs> uh, so, so every electron has an inherent spin. And then we also have orbital angular momentum that's quantized as electrons orbit around a nucleus that in certain materials builds up um, interesting magnetic behavior. It could be ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, ferrimagnetic, and other types of spin ordering in materials. And so spintronics is really like, how can we utilize that for computing? It's a really exciting area for neuromorphic computing. And I can tell you why. So um, magnetic materials, first of all, if we really wanna think about not just playing around with these things, but actually eventually making these computers, there are a lot of requirements that we need to be satisfied. Just think about how many requirements it took. And the only one that could do von Neumann was like silicon basically. Now there's some new ones, right? But you know, there's a lot. Um, just think it has to be able to eventually be manufactured in a big, foundry, right? So that's the first thing that magnetic materials are really great for is they're already being developed for um, memory applications. And so we already know that they are back on the line compatible. That means we can process them on top of silicon transistors to combine the technologies together. They're non-volatile. So once you set a magnet in a certain direction, as long as thermally stable, it's going to stay there. And they have theoretically unlimited endurance because 
again, if you have a magnet and you just imagine switching the magnet, as long as you do that gently, it can be switched mm -hmm. forever. There's, there's no loss from switching a magnet. So that's really exciting. And the other nice thing is this aerospintronics was really first developed to explore, and we still do in our group, used in traditional von Neumann computing. And there, this act of switching a magnet that you can actually prove is, is very energy efficient. Uh, so there, there's a nice application of switching magnets. And we can switch magnets with fields like we're more used to, but we can also switch them with electrical current and with voltages. And with other things like strain and heat, things like that can all affect the magnetization. So there's a lot of knobs we have to, to turn. So it's another good thing. And then the main thing though that I think makes them really attractive for neuromorphic computing is that there's so many rich dynamical effects in these materials that exist at the nanoscale that we can harness, right? So we have a magnet, it can have this steady state magnetization vector that we can move around, but there's also other effects. We can have oscillatory behavior, in time, so that brings in this time component. They're also naturally um, stochastic. So there's this thermal stability that we can tune, just like we have stochastic behaviors in the brain. And then there's a lot of spin textures we can create and control that are naturally nanoscale. So um, one big area in my group is we control magnetic domain walls. So you have two magnetic domains. So you have a material and in one region, the magnetization is pointed one way, and the other region is pointed the other way. And in, in between the two, we have a wall, domain wall. And so we can move that around in our material. It can have like time-based effects. It can have stochastic and dynamical behaviors that we can use. And there's other types of spin textures that are very interesting. There is ones called skirmions, which are like a domain wall, but they have an energy protection to them once they're created. And they also can be very small. When I say small, like, you can tune the size between microns down to nanometers. So yeah, so we're really interested in using all that richness in these spintronic materials for neuromorphic computing. So for neuromorphic computing, is it going to try to replace transistors or what is the application physically within the chip? Yeah, I think that our community is pretty convinced that it's not going to replace transistors. Yeah. Um, uh, transistors have developed like I said, through this tight co-design and, and our, our wonderful things, right? So that's another reason why we really want our new technologies to be compatible with existing silicon technology, silicon processing and transistors so that we can grow without removing what's already doing so well. Cool. So I'm just wondering, you mentioned like the tuning aspect and from the magnetization standpoint, I was just wondering, you've talked about a lot of the benefits and just to provide the comprehensive picture, are there any challenges that come with like from the Spintronics standpoint, like potentially processing or like, you know, it seems like there's a lot of customizability here. What kind of drawbacks come with this new category of materials? Yeah, so there are definitely a lot of challenges and a lot of active research in this area. So in my group, for example, we want to, we're working on controlling these domain walls and using them in devices to either act as neurons or synapses or other functions. Controllability is still something that's very unexplored. So, you know, when we think of a silicon transistor, we need to be able to predict really precisely how, when it's going to switch and what errors it's going to have. And so um, being able to like take this domain wall and this nanoscale device, put it where you want, put it where you want in a very repeatable way over you know, thousands of cycles is something that is an open question of whether we can do that. And so that's something that we're really interested in studying, how we can better control them. And then also there can be challenges in patterning magnetic structures. So um, a good thing about them is they're, they're very robust once you create them. They're hard to, like, we, we work with devices that are like 10 years old, and they still work, right? So that's good. But mm. with that, partly because of that, there's very little chemical etch technologies that can, well, there's none, that can <laughs> um, define these structures. Yeah. So we, we, while most of other materials classes can use chemical methods to define nanostructures, we have to use just like elect ion bombardment methods, some more like physical etching to etch them mm. into shapes that we want, the nanoscale shapes. And so that has challenges then with like sidewalls and also scaling to really, really small dimensions of our devices can be a challenge. Um, and another thing is that when they get really small, they're also super, super delicate, right? Like I said, the magnet could, could switch forever as long as we treat it 
very gently, right? I said that there's other layers in our our devices. For example, we we utilize um, quantum tunneling to convert magnetic information to electrical information, and that requires current passing across a very thin um, insulating layer, a tunnel barrier, and so any wrong current can easily hurt such layers. So there's there's a lot to go on, and then there's a lot just of open questions about really understanding and controlling the material behaviors to make them at the level to use an application. And so that's the spintronic material. Going back to the 2D material with your graphene and your polymer, those seems like maybe not as robust systems with the polymer, maybe more prone to failure. Uh, can you talk about those challenges of scaling up and uh, the benefits of having this system? Yeah, there's, there's different pros and cons. So I'll talk about one thing and then I'll get to more of the fabrication. So one thing is that there's different time scales of operation of these devices. So our spintronic synapses we've developed switch on the order of magnetization reversal, which is around a nanosecond in time. Mm -hmm. Our um, graphene-based um, conductive, like electrochemical RAM type synapses, those respond to electrochemical impulses, which is more on the order of microseconds. Maybe it could get down to tens of nanoseconds but on the slower side. Now, operations in the brain tend to be more closer to the graphene-like side of things. So being that, so it depends what your application is versus our computers today, they want like picoseconds, right? So it's even faster than the Spintronics. So we're kind of operating in different regimes and therefore probably different applications. So for our graphene synapses, one thing that we're really trying to do there is cater them towards the application of actual integration or taking data from biological systems because they're operating at that time scale of biological events. And so we took care in that work to make sure that all of the materials were biocompatible. So the graphene is biocompatible and we use gold electrodes and we use this nephion, which is known to be biocompatible. And that's why we were pursuing those materials for that particular application. So I think they're really going to find homes in different types of neuromorphic computing applications. And then as for the fabrication and other challenges with graphene and other 2D materials, hmm, um, so there's there's been a lot of effort over the last 10, 20 years to um, grow these materials on silicon substrates mm -hmm. in back and line compatible ways, like I said, so that they could be integrated directly with silicon. So there's been a lot of progress on that front in the field. I don't work in that area, but I know there has been, so I think it's no longer, it used to be you talk about 2D materials and then someone would always say, yeah, but they're never going to be made in a large enough volume on a, on a big wafer to be used. But I don't think that's true anymore, but it's still something people are working on. So especially as we introduce new, like this large library of 2D materials, every time we introduce a new material, like, well, how is this going to be grown? And then how is it going to be grown in a way that's compatible with silicon? <laughs> so there's mm -hmm. two questions, right? Yeah, so um, that's still a challenge. And then then it's about, once once they're grown though, you can use most of the standard lithography te techniques to pattern them. So we don't have much issues with patterning them into the structures we want once they're grown. Cool. So then I wanted to get into the, the etching aspect. I was just wondering, like, um, I know you mentioned that that's still very much in the early stages, you know, potentially challenges to overcome from the fabrication and scaling up. But, you know, we've talked about it in previous episodes. I was wondering, is there any exploration into like uh, bottom up manufacturing, additive manufacturing instead of, you know, the selecting selective removal of material in this space? It's a good question. I've, I've heard throughout the years, various groups talking about trying that but I haven't seen much um, develop yet for the spintronic materials in that area. And I think one of the challenges is that, okay, we have like our magnetic layer that we're switching, but there's a lot of other ultra thin layers that make up a full thin film stack that we then pattern into magnetic nanostructure, sometimes as many as 30 layers. And some of them are as thin as less than a nanometer. Yeah. so. So usually we have to then precisely grow all those in a system that can do that kind of growth. And we really focus first on the growth of every layer 
And then after that, we can pattern. So that makes it a little bit harder to do this type of manufacturing from bottom up because you have less control over, okay, now we need this material, now we need this material and layered in this precise way. If there's just one material, it's a lot easier to do that. So mm -hmm. hopefully it'll come in the future, but right now, usually we grow first and then we pattern. So at the very beginning, you mentioned how neuromorphic computing could be used to enable better AI on the edge of computing or uh, on the cloud. What implications does this technology have for supercomputing or quantum computing? Yeah, the applications of supercomputing or quantum computing. There's a lot. The, the project I mentioned that is most closely related to that, that I'm working on is this co-design project on probabilistic computing. And that is from the Department of Energy and it's led by Sandia National Labs and our group is part of that team. Um, and they are, we're trying to think that right now, again, our supercomputers are good at doing certain things, but we can imagine new supercomputers that are more tailored to the, um, the problem they're trying to solve. And that's kind of like what a quantum computer is. It's like a computer that's gonna solve specific hard problems, right? And so we can think more broadly about how new materials can enable new types of quantum inspired computers mm -hmm. to solve specific problems. Yeah, so in that case, we are, and this is an area that's a really big area of research, not just in my group, but in our whole field, we're looking at how these magnetic devices can act as um, random number generators. And the nice thing about them, so you can think of a magnet and it's either magnetized up or down, right? But if you can get it to go to its middle state, then it could pop up, up or down, right? So then it can be a random number generator. The nice thing is that not only is that possible, but also we can tune the weight of that coin, of that random flip coin. So using currents and voltages, we can then say, okay, it has a 50-50 chance, it's a fair coin, or maybe a 60-40 chance of being heads or tails. And so that's super useful. And that's something that's really hard to get without new materials and new devices. Because if we want to do the type of tuning with a traditional pseudo random number generator based on silicon and transistors, that is a, a really big long process versus we can do that with a single flip of a coin with our magnetic coins. That's what we're working on with that project. And then when we have this tunable probability, then it can have a lot of nice application in probabilistic algorithms. And so this is a co-design team. We have people on the team who are experts in probabilistic algorithms, which I am not. And um, they're working on, a, on taking what we are showing and then um, integrating it into their algorithm. And like I said, those can be used to solve prob naturally probabilistic problems much more energy efficiently than a computer that is not tuned to that function. And I think also more generally, though, these new materials can lead to ways to solve problems that traditional computers takes a lot of energy to solve. And so quantum computing is an example, um, but there's other quantum inspired computers that can also accomplish these things. So in that in the paper we recently published on these um, probabilistic magnetic tunnel junctions, um, we did the example of once we have them, we simulated how they could be used to solve simulated annealing problem. So we have a problem um, in this case, it was the maximum satisfiability problem. So we have a certain set of um, conditions we want to maximally satisfy. And this is something that is hard to do. It's really, it really takes a lot of energy and time to do this with their traditional computers. And we showed how we could have our magnetic uh, tunnel junction randomness. We can think of its random tuning of its randomness as an effective temperature. And so then if we lower that temperature, we can naturally solve the problem. This is called simulated annealing. And if something that's done in quantum computers, we can also do it in magnetic-based computers. And we don't have to be at, this is all at room temperature. So I think there's gonna be a lot of growth of quantum computing, but also all these other types of quantum-inspired computing with new materials coming up in the next decades or two. Cool. I like the idea of the quantum-inspired computers in addition to just pure quantum computing, supercomputing, et cetera. Yeah, we, you know, like when, back when like D-Wave first came out, they were doing simulated annealing type problems. And I remember they got a lot of pushback of, this isn't quantum computing. Now, even at the time I was like, 
if it's working, who cares? <laughs> yeah, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 why, why do we have to just, like, quantum computing doesn't need to be limited to just, like, entanglement and superposition. Now, those are fantastic um, properties that we should harness, but right. there's a lot of other properties, too. Right. And so yeah. before we get into kind of, like, I know we asked a similar question at Puzzle X, but before we get into kind of what you think the future of this this space looks like and your, the impact of neuromorphic um, computing within this industry, I just wanted to ask because I've noticed you're working with a lot of different like cross functional partners. What is your what does your lab group look like? You know, what does your team look like in terms of all the different functions and the and the team members that you're working with? Yeah, that's a great question. I have about 15 people in my direct team. So that's two postdocs, and then the rest are graduate students doing their PhD with me. And I also have a lot of undergraduates who participate in research with my group. Uh, so we love having undergraduates. And we've even had um, some high school students um, come join us for a few summers. Uh, so that's my team itself. And then we have a lot of partners, as you can, as you can tell, is very interdisciplinary. Yeah, so we work with people all around the world. Um, we currently have a project with Samsung. Yeah, we partner a lot with Sandia National Labs, because um, I really enjoy the, the um, research landscape at that national lab. And we, we enjoy working with them a lot. And we work with circuit designers, system people, and then um, all across the gambit and, and and in my group itself you know like i said it's kind of like materials devices circuits and systems and so the students can choose based on their interests which level like of course we want to be in vertically trained but we can choose which level we are most interested in so some of my students are down really at the materials level focusing on growth characterization and new materials but we always try to think about like, what is it for and have that application informed um, research. And then some students are more focused on the device level. So they're taking materials that have been grown sometimes by us, sometimes by collaborators in industry, for example. And then they work on the nano patterning and the device testing and also the modeling of how these devices could behave in neuromorphic computers. So we do a lot of work with modeling um, on supercomputers and things like that. And then some students are um, also working on the application side. So they get trained in how to do neural network simulators and they can take the device data and they can feed it into neural networks or other types of circuit simulators and see how they're performing. And then we can then inform the materials and devices in that way. Um, so one thing about this field is I think it's a really great opportunity to bring in um, people who are interested in I think a lot of students are interested in um, deep learning, neural, neural networks and things like that. So um, they can have that, they can use those skills in this space while also developing skills in hardware and material science, these like hard areas, which sometimes people are worried about going into. So there's really room for, for lots, of, lots of great activity in this space. That's awesome. Yeah. And especially from like the material scientist perspective for a material scientist to be able to enter that type of group and then get that like deep learning experience as well. You know, that also seems like a very valuable um, skill set to have it going into the industry. So that's yes, really cool. yeah, it gives them a lot of opportunities um, right when they graduate. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then, okay. One more quick question, but I was just wondering, you mentioned the characterization of new materials. What exactly are you are your students looking for um, in terms of that material okay. development? Yeah, so um, we, have a, we have a bunch of different materials um, research going on. So I'll have to pick one. <laughs> um, so, so, well, okay, I'll pick one. It's, it's hard to pick. They're all so great. Um, <laughs> so, for example, on the magnetic materials, like I said, there's these multi-layer stacks that are grown. So we have a couple projects on trying to insert new materials into those stacks to have new function. One area that we're interested in is this tunnel barrier. So electrons tunnel across a barrier and that, that tunneling process usually preserves spin. And so we then can read out electrically, if, a ma if we have two magnets and they're magnetized the same way, it'll be easier to tunnel. And if they're magnetized the opposite way, it'll be harder to tunnel. So we get high current, low current. 
And that's how we read out our money. That's like one the main way to read out magnetic state. There's other ways, but that's the one that we know of right now that has the highest on-off ratio. So we can actually use it in our computers. So that's called tunnel magneto resistance or TMR for short. That process of tunneling across this barrier, it requires a lot of things. And there's really only one like magic material that does that well, which is magnesium oxide. Magnetic tunneling was first um, discovered with aluminum oxide. But as soon as magnesium oxide was discovered, everyone moved to magnesium oxide. And it's definitely been like the tunnel barrier for a long time, like over 15 years. And so we're really interested in what other materials could have um, this type of tunneling effect. Motivation is because magnesium oxide can, can have the tunneling effect really well, but it also has pretty high resistance. And so what that means, we, we have to make it very thin. So less than 1.5 nanometers. And so you can imagine then the challenges of making such a thin structure, especially off over a 12 inch wafer. And then also um, it's super delicate. So, uh, you know, any, any stray current or voltage can break that really thin barrier. And it also is preventing us to get to lower resistance limits of our magnetic tunnel junction based devices. And lower resistance limits are what we need for like future hard disk drive technologies and things like that. So um, so that's one area we're working on is we're growing some other materials. Um, we started out doing um, first principle theory of new materials. And so we did theory on this other candidate material, which is scandium nitride. We originally were interested in it because it's actually a caddy corner to magnesium oxide, scandium and magnesium on the periodic table. Um, so it has like sim- there's, there's this, like old I thought that caddy corner materials kind of similar size to the crystal structures. And, and yeah, so they're both are rock salt crystal structure. But we're really interested, the skin nitride has a smaller band gap. And also we're interested in how nitrogen versus oxygen, how it differs in this type of tunneling system. So we started out with the first principle theory. So like from the quantum mechanics done on our supercomputer here at, in Austin, um, it's called TAC. Texas Advanced Community Center. So we did that and it was, it was looking promising. So then once our theory looks promising, then we moved to the growth. So now my students are actually growing this material um, using sputter deposition um, and integrating into our tunnel junctions. But it's, it's not an easy task, right? Because every time you change one thing, other things change. Like, well, maybe there's a better electrode material for that tunnel barrier. Uh, what temperature does it need to be grown at? How, how smooth can we make it? Um, there's a lot of detailed material science that still needs to be done, but we're having fun doing it. That's really fascinating. So I I really love the the materials science aspect, and I'm glad you really like dove into it. So this was like very insightful. I'm happy to t- give you an example on the 2D material side too, if you want. <laughs> sure. Yeah. May, sure. Maybe very briefly go into the 2D side of things too, sure. and then we can so, dive into. Uh, sure. Yeah. So yeah. Um, another example project that we did published last year on the 2D material side. I'm interested in 2D materials on their own, but also in how they like to spin tronics, right? Can't help it. <laughs> um, so they don't have to be always thin, but it, one thing that is a really exciting feature of certain 2D materials, is called the spin and valley hall effect. Have you ever heard of that one? Yeah, no. so um, if you have a 2D material, so it's naturally atomically thin, so you have electron confinement, and now you also have one of the elements be a heavy metal. So the one we're studying is tungsten diselenide. So tungsten is very heavy. So what that happens when they're really heavy is that um, as the electron moves around its atom, there's really strong spin orbit coupling. So it's spin is strongly coupled to its orbital angular momentum. And when there's strong spin orbit coupling, then we can get a spin current in our material. So um, we, we have, we make, again, we make this 2D material, it comes to this in this case, monolayer into a transistor. We turn it on, electrons conduct across the transistor, and then up and down spin currents conduct with a right hand rule to the sides. Mm. This, this is like this, this spins. And then not only is it a spin current, but we actually get what's called a valley current. So these spins are coupled to, to different momentum states. So basically they have different momentum. And that makes them um, more well preserved, these spin currents, because if you were to scatter, you have to scatter not just spin, but also momentum. 
So that's mm-hmm. where we get this spin current and we get a valley current. Now, the caveat here is everything else I've talked about up, up to now is all room temperature, but this is not. Mm-hmm. So eventually you can get decoherence of uh, at higher temperatures, but theoretically it could be a room temperature effect or, you, or even closer room temperature effect. And what I think is really exciting about it is that there are a lot of spin currents that we have already, but most of them are in conductors or in insulators. It's actually pretty uncommon to have a spin current in a semiconductor. So here, the tungsten diselenide is a semiconductor, so we can turn it on and off. So that's pretty exciting that we can, with voltage, just like a just like our silicon transistors, we can turn on turn on our tungsten diselenide and get a spin current. Um, that'd be really exciting because oftentimes when we build devices and circuits out of these materials, we want what's called a one T one R structure. So for every resistor, there's a transistor. That's, that's the R and the T. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one T, one R. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that's like when you like a neural network or anything like that. It's a one T, one R. These could act as the T to our magnetic R, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. So they could be the, the transistors that integrate mm-hmm. with our magnetic devices. So we're really interested in that effect. So we did a project on um, optically detecting the Spin Valley Hall effect. And we showed that we could optically detect it up to 160 Kelvin. So that, that's it's been detected optically. And that's pretty good. Like 160 Kelvin, like we could, even if we couldn't, hopefully we, event, we could get warmer than that. But even that, it's, it's pretty usable at that yeah. temperature. Uh, so yeah. And we also looked at how we could control the effect with voltage. So like I said, we have these mater- fundamental materials projects, but we're thinking about the questions needed to get to the application, things like, can we control a voltage? What temperature can we get it to? Those are the kind of questions we're interested in. That's awesome. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see this field grow and, and track your group's progress as well as the industry's progress um, with neuromorphic computing. And so I would just want you to kind of wrap up this episode with your advice for students interested in neuromorphic computing, potentially the material science behind it all, and what applications they they could potentially be working on in the future. You know, if they're the next generation of material scientists working in this space, what do you think they could be working on or, or focusing on? Okay, so as for my advice, you know, I, I am the joy of teaching freshmen here at UT Austin in electrical and computer engineering. I teach, yeah, freshman intro to electrical engineering course. And it's always so lovely to meet the freshman students. And so many of them have gone into ECE because they liked physics in high school, but maybe their parents or guardians recommended engineering to them, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so um, I think that if that's the kind of person someone is, that they, they enjoy physical science, but they want a more application focus, then this is a really nice spot. And that's why I ended up in this area. I started out in physics and I really love physics, but I wanted to um, see the more practical application of my work. So I think if I would just advise students to reflect on what interests them. And if that is something of interest, then get involved. So like I said, I, I have undergrads working in my research group. So wherever you are, I'm sure you can reach out to faculty at your university um, working in this area and um, ask the volunteer in their labs, learn a little more about it and get to know other students in the area because they can then advise you on what courses to take and um, what to become an expert in. And also, I think just in general, it's like just the advice to pick something you're interested in and just don't worry too much besides like learning and getting interested in it because um, there's space for that if you advance career in that direction, or you might go in a different direction, but there's space for that expertise if that's what you end up wanting to do. Yeah. Um, and what was your second question again? The second question the was, yeah, just more so like, you know, what does the future hold for, for this space? You know, what, it, what could students who are, who are very interested in, you know, getting into neuromorphic computing, what could they look forward to potentially? Yeah. So I think that neuromorphic computing is a wide open space with, with which is going to be around for a long time. And it's certainly tied to both the applications going on today. And then as we move forward, new materials are going to come up this pipeline to the application. So I think that whatever level you end up landing at is really exciting, right? So there's so much going on just with using transistors today, silicon transistors, and building neuromorphic computers. And so that's what we're going to see come out first, right? Because that's using the existing platform. And um, 
it's an exciting space to be in. And then um, you can also be in a space of new materials that are going to impact this field, which will come um, down the line as well. But I think um, sooner than we think, because there's such new paradigms of computing, it's really an opportunity for new materials to be co-designed with them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeannie, and for joining us today. This is a super fun conversation and um, yeah, very grateful for you joining the show. Yeah, no problem. And I really just want to shout out to the the whole field that I'm in of spintronics and 2D materials and normal for computing. It's, it's a really large field and there's a lot of fantastic people working in this space. So um, I encourage anyone listening to to um, look at look at a lot of the activity going on in this area. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Let's wrap it up there. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.